I had my own problems with dyslexia, and I realized afterwards that my artist father also was dyslexic. And when our two sons started having difficulties, I figured out that I better try to figure out what was going on here because it was affecting at least three generations. But also because I'm from this family of artists, my parents met in art school, uh, and engineers, especially on my mother's side, or engineers going back many generations, that there's all kinds of visual knowledge uh, in the arts, in science, and engineering, and other areas, even mathematics, if you're dealing with geometry and that kind of thing. These are, these are all very visual, and most of the people who are dealing with, with dyslexia professionally and, and fixing problems we're focusing on reading, and it's still the case. <laughs> There's a long history, and that's, I guess, another one of the traits that dyslexics deal with, is to look at the big picture. And so I started to say, where, when was dyslexia first identified? And I realized right from the very beginning, from the 1880s, there would be students that were identified as being incapable of reading, but in fact, they were the most brilliant persons in the schools, they were known to be that. They said if it was only oral, that, that this was the most brilliant student in the school. They're basically some th ideas that I want to really get across, and that is that some want to teach mainly reading and bring dyslexics up to normal basic skills. But we want to study the superstars to learn how they did it and how similar they are to ourselves. So if we study the successful, we can learn things that are useful to all, especially in a rapidly changing technological context, where, of course, we're at the threshold of another major computer age where the machines can do not the low-level clerical things, it can do the high-level professional things. And my basic argument is you need these the different thinking coming from dyslexics and other different thinkers to deal with these new phenomena. We have great advantages with these new technologies, but we have new big problems. And uh, I think we have to look to, uh, to the dyslexics and other different thinkers for solutions. Um, there's another aspect is I, most of what I do is, is uh, telling stories, f gathering stories from what I regard as really very interesting people. And really, uh, I think it's over time, it's been my privilege to m travel to many countries and to meet many people. And I think that just some of the most interesting, most creative, most intelligent people on the planet's surface, <laughs> I say. And, uh, but it, many of them are dyslexic, but so others are people who have autism or Asperger's or something like that. I know Asperger's is a word that isn't supposed to be used anymore, but the people with Asperger's tend to use that word, so I use it as well. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, so I, I talk, think about listening to the stories in depth, then collect data. As a medical history tells you what to look for and count, anecdotes may lead to treasures. These stories can give you a perception of something that you would not ordinarily think of. And sometimes in, in trying to understand things, we may count the wrong things. Many talents are invisible to conventional tests and measures. Diversity is not a pathology, not a disease, <laughs> is another term. Uh, so it, I, I make the point is, People talk about a scientific survey. Well, they're talking about a random sample and that kind of thing. But in fact, I think of this as a characteristic of old science. You want to generalize to large populations and you ignore individual differences as if they're not important. And it happens with dyslexia especially, according to the, neuro the neurologist I quote, is that it's the nature's way of producing lots of different brains that have lots of different mixes of strengths and weaknesses. And therefore, you need a, a view to not look at everybody who's the same. You need to be able to look at individual differences. So I say boldly, new science, you're dealing with small things that matter. Individuals matter. Differences matter. 
So I tell the dys young dyslexics, time is on your side. All the things you've had trouble with are becoming less and less important. All the things you are good at are becoming more and more important. Machines are now doing the reading and recall and clerical tasks. Humans should not do machine work. Rather, humans need to visualize, see the big picture, understand, recognize patterns, consider slowly and ponder what it all means, where to go and how to get there. And this is different from a sort of specialist culture, which we have in abundance everywhere <laughs> in all fields. We feel as though if you're a specialist in this area, then you, you can't talk about this other thing. Whereas I think so many dyslexics tend to be able to draw patterns between different specialist areas, and this is terribly invaluable in my view. Basically, many dyslexics and strong visual thinkers seem poorly adapted to the old technologies of words and books, memorizing old knowledge. But many seem perfectly adapted to the new technologies of complex information, visualized in computer graphic images, creating new knowledge, seeing what others cannot see. We need to find ways to help students identify and employ their own distinctive capabilities. And I, did, I think to do this, we look to the highly successful, trying to figure out what to teach and how to teach.